micronutrient production. I hope you enjoy it. My name is Femi O'K. I am your host for this morning. Can you read this? Oh, good. What does it say? Women's Nutrition Now. Pardon? Women's Nutrition Now. Oh, fantastic. All right. Uh, I suggest you use it as we're actually going through the morning. If you're, you're tweety, tweeting um, and you're talking about this actual panel in the session, this is a really critical hashtag to be using, so use that. If you have a phone or your iPad, put it on vibrate, because it would be really, really, really embarrassing if when Madame Joyce Banda, if she starts to speak and then your phone is going off, that would be just awful. And we're so intimate that we actually can see each other and we would know whose phone it was. So put it on vibrate. Let me tell you about who's in the session, other than you, and you're very welcome. And you also have the former president of Milan, Joyce Bander. Her friends call her JB. I, I'm not sure I can call you JB yet, JB. Oh, I can. Okay. 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 Very good. Very good. Um, if you were going to say, what in your resume made you particularly qualified to be in this conversation about women's nutrition now, what one thing would you pick? Um, this is the introduction. Yeah. Before you do your setting the scene. Number one, the rest can be Google, but I'm a board member of Michael Newton. Ah. And uh, <laughs> one thing that I have done in my life is to ensure that um, I place nutrition at the top of my agenda. Why? Because experts have told us that the first 1,000 days of every human being are the most critical. And for me, it's imperative that uh, nutrition should be important. And therefore, it is my privilege and honor to belong to the board of my community. Good morning, Gerda Berber from Scaling Up Nutrition, otherwise known as SUN. From your extensive resume, what one thing would you pick that made you go, hmm, this is why I'm here? Uh, the most important is, uh, I think that I was born and raised on a farm. I was one of ten siblings, and I was uh, learned. I, I learned as a baby how important it is to have uh, good food because that's the engine for everything. But later on, uh, I was also a minister of agriculture, nature, and food quality, and the combination is an excellent one to make you much more aware. Because at that time, I was able to. Uh, be also international, active uh, on an international uh, level, um, and that was just on the underscoring what I had learned already when I was born. Excellent. And finally, Phyllis Costasa is uh, the CEO of UBS Optimus Foundation. Phyllis, good morning, welcome. You know what I'm going to ask you? How are you going to answer it? <laughs> well, I would say that the one thing um, that really inspired me and taught me about this was 19 years ago when I had my first child. And um, for those of you who have children, you know that that is the most important thing that you can do and we all learn that, we research it. And um, that was probably the most important thing to me that really uh, underscored the importance of this issue. Right. Maybe a little bit more from each of our panelists before we start the discussion, setting the scene, um, and what's important to you in this conversation. So, Madam Banda, please, you can start. Yes. Okay. Yeah, um, allow me to first congratulate Micronutrients Initiative for all the work that you're doing around the world. I, for the first time, found out that one billion women and girls around the globe are malnourished, and therefore, for me, it's an epidemic, and for therefore, for me, it's a must that we must take action. But secondly, I accepted to serve on the board of micronutrients because I found out that they reach out to 500 million most vulnerable women and children with a critical nutrition intervention. Yesterday, in the speeches in the morning and in the afternoon, we heard about the importance of data, collecting data on issues of nutrition of the girl child, of the woman, 
And now, through the same data, we are now being told that one billion human beings are undernourished. With that evidence on our hands, I have come this morning to declare that I want to be part of the champions that are going to do something about nutrition in the world. Nutrition, malnutrition is as a result of poverty, inequity, and the most persistent barrier to improved human development. For me, as an African woman, I worry most about female-headed households. For me, I worry about the elderly-headed households. And for me, I worry about child-headed households. An example that I have is that of uh, the school that I built in one village in Malawi. And we target child-headed households in order to qualify to come to the school. And we noticed that because in Malawi, education, secondary education is not free. This is the one school where they can come free. But we also provide one meal a day, one nutritious meal a day. But this child in a child-headed household has four siblings at home. So sometimes they hesitate to come to school. As a result, we had to come up with a program where we give them a pack to take home for the siblings at home. So the motivation for this girl child to come to school is because at the end of the day, she will also go back home with a pack, a pre-cooked pack that in four minutes, five minutes, she can have a meal for her four siblings. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, added to that, I am also desperate that we need to do something about nutrition. Why? Because experts have told us that the first 1,000 days are very critical, from inception to 1,000 days, which is about three years in a child's life, in the development of her brain, in the development of her body, in, the, in determining how tall or short she's going to be, or he is, this child is going to be. Why I'm desperate is because in a country like Malawi, where I come from, 47% of the children are born stunted. And for me, it's not fair and it's unacceptable. That not only that, that do, do the women suffer, but also the offspring, the children, and especially those that are underprivileged. We are told that uh, 180 million children go to school on an empty stomach. What is also most disturbing for me as an African woman is that most of this is related to um, tradition and culture. Because women eat last and least. That men have become the primary beneficiaries of our toil. We produce, we process, we store, we cook. But at the end of the day, we eat last and least. And tradition is play, playing a role in that because at household level, the boys eat with their fathers. So if there's one egg in the house or two eggs, it's for the boy and this, uh, the, for, for the father and this child, the boy child. The, father, the mother and the girls are in the kitchen. And it happens even at this level. A very critical example is when we had a house boy in our house who has been with us for a long time. And there were two eggs remaining in the house. And Roderick decided that one egg would be brought to the table today for my husband, and the other egg is for tomorrow for my husband. So I asked him, I said, where is my egg? He says, no, but there are only two. So dad must eat an egg today, and dad must eat an egg tomorrow. And he realized that I was upset, and when I insisted, I wanted to know why, he says, I don't understand where you see a problem here, telling you. The following day, I overhear my husband telling him what he did last night, you must never do again. The way you treat my wife, you must also treat me. 
And I came running down the stairs. I said, no, there will never be any next time because you've lost your job. That is what is happening at house, uh, house of level where I come from. And if it happens at this level, what more at grassroots? Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, for me, donors, international community, civil society organizations must take action. But more importantly, as somebody who has been head of state, it is political will on the part of the president, the leader in the country. We have a role to play. We can influence the decisions. I've been there. There's so much power when you are head of state. But my request to my fellow heads of state globally is that we must use that power for good. We must use that power to benefit those that are underprivileged. We can come up with increased budgets for nutrition. We can partner with donors that want to assist us. There's no way we are just going to sit back and wait, wait for handouts. We must make a contribution. And for that to happen, leaders across the globe, including Africa, must fight corruption and save every single cent for those that are underprivileged. I say this deliberately because I know that it is not easy to fight corruption. Where some of us come from, we have tried and paid heavily. Because they fight you back. You are dealing with people that are powerful. And I was advised across the continent to say, cover it up. Cover it up. These days you don't fight corruption. I received the death threats. And I was told, we will bring you back down and you will never win the next election. The decision leaders must make across the globe is that as donors come, they will also respect us if we make a contribution. If we make savings from the meager resources that we have. Thank you, all of you, as uh, Manabanda was speaking. Um, and the most expressive face I could see was Verda's. And Verda, your face did this. At the point where Manabanda was talking about political will. Why did that resonate? Ah, because I'm a politician myself. Um, I've been in Parliament, I've been a minister, and know how crucial it is uh, for governments to take ownership. And to say it's not only uh, for uh, today, it's not only during this year, it's not only until the next election. It is a decision and uh, we will live up to this decision. And especially when it comes to nutrition, it's not only a topic for this year, next year, not a year. It's a topic that has to be um, during a lifetime, starting with, indeed, the inception and the first thousand days are <laughs> crucial, but we need a more structural change. And governments and politicians have to lead the dance. They cannot do it on their own, but they have to show leadership. Say good morning to Amy Baker. Good morning, Amy Baker. Hello, come stand over here. <laughs> Amy Baker is the Director General for Health and Nutrition and Global Affairs Canada. Uh, as she's standing up there, you'll see that she looks nothing like Minister Babo. Um, <laughs> the reason for that is Minister Babo had to leave the conference and she had to go on a business. So, Amy is going to be filling that role. Amy, good morning. Uh, distinguished panel, uh, honoured guests. Um, first of all, I want to say uh, that I come with the most sincere regrets from uh, Minister Mary-Claude Bibot, the Minister for International Development and the Francophonie from uh, Canada. She uh, really was excited to be here today and until late last night thought that she would be here today. Uh, she's on a plane back right now. We had urgent votes. In Um, we had urgent votes in Parliament uh, this morning, and uh, it's a wonderful thing that we have free votes in our parliamentary process, but it means that sometimes uh, there are some last-minute changes. So uh, she asked me to be here this morning to deliver her prepared remarks. So if you would like to close your eyes and imagine Minister Bivo, this is, uh, <laughs> this is her voice that you'll be hearing. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to be here with you today to talk about how we can ensure the health rights and well-being of women and girls around the world. 
I am sure you will agree with me that investing in nutrition for women and girls is critical because when women and girls are healthy and well-nourished, they can work wonders. We know that too often, as JB has eloquently put it, women and girls eat least and last. We also know that women and their children can be caught in an ongoing cycle of poverty and malnutrition. So one of the best things that we can do is give them access to nutritious food. This will help them survive, thrive, and meet their maximum potential. What can we do to make this happen? We can begin by investing in high-impact nutrition interventions that we know will work, like these few examples. We can provide vitamin A. One capsule costs two cents to manufacture. Two doses a year can reduce child mortality by up to 24%. We can provide iron supplements, and we can fortify food by adding iron to wheat and maize and flour and rice, or add it to salt along with iodine. As an example, Canada is proud to support the global nutrition efforts such as Scaling Up Nutrition Movement, or the Sun Movement. Sun spearheads the collective efforts of government, civil society, and the United Nations to support countries so that they can prioritize nutrition, as you may hear more about. Canada is also a founding donor of the Micronutrient Initiative and the largest donor to vitamin A supplementation programs worldwide. Let me come back to adolescent girls and their untapped potential. I recently heard a story, I, I heard it from her, so I guess I heard it too, um, that beautifully illustrates what a difference iron and folic supplements made for one young girl. Allow me to do a quick aside on anemia. If any of you have ever experienced anemia, you'll know how tired and sluggish it can make you feel. Anemia affects half a billion women of reproductive age. That is nearly one out of three women. And the effects on adolescent girls are particularly harmful during a time when their bodies need even more vitamins and minerals to fuel their rapid growth. I wanted to tell you the story of Nikat, an adolescent girl who lives in a village in India where eight out of 10 girls were anemic. Thanks to the Micronutrient Initiative, Nikat and other girls at her school received iron and folic acid supplements. And gradually, Nikat began to feel better. As she said, it's a magical tablet that gives strength to do more work. I feel more active and I'm able to concentrate better on my studies since I started taking the tablets. But one day, she found out that out-of-school girls wouldn't go to the local health post to receive the supplements. So she decided to do something about it. Nikat and her friend Sunita, who worked at the health post, started to keep a list of girls who couldn't come and get their supplements. Every Tuesday evening, they would go see these girls at home and deliver their supplements to them. Nikat would also tell the girls about the possible side effects and encourage them to keep taking the tablets. I love this story because it not only shows what a powerful difference micronutrients made for one girl, but how she became a mentor and guide to her peers. That story proves one thing. When they are empowered, women and girls can work wonders. With our new stronger focus on women and girls, we are pleased to support Micronutrient Initiative's country-level efforts to address the nutrition needs of adolescent girls, thus complementing our investments in national health systems. That is why Canada is proud to launch the Right Start Initiative under the Micronutrient Initiative, which aims to reach 100 million girls and women. We have provided anchor funding of $75 million to the Right Start Initiative, and I will leave Joel to tell you more about it in a few minutes. Now you really need to imagine Minister Beeple. Today, I am seeking your support to seize this opportunity with me to truly scale up global efforts on nutrition for women and girls. I am challenging you all to join Canada in supporting initiatives such as the Right Start Initiative so that up to 100 million more women and girls can receive the nutrition interventions that are so critical to their health. We want women to actively participate in the development of their communities and their countries as entrepreneurs, as political leaders, as educators, as mothers. And we all need to put our weight behind this initiative so that more girls will have a start in life that will help them to thrive and to reach their full potential. Together, we will support women and girls to work wonders. Thank you. Alice, how do you want to set the scene for us? What's important for you to tell us before we get into a discussion? Well, uh, 
I'll give you a different perspective on uh, the micronutrient issue. Uh, I come from the private sector. I work for a company called UBS, and um, this is not UPS, it's not USB, it's UBS. It's the largest wealth management firm globally. And also, I am very honored to be on the board of Micronutrient Initiative. Um, so in my role working in the private sector, we are responsible for managing people's wealth. And as part of managing their wealth, they are just as interested in how do they make money on their money or preserve their assets as they are in how do we give it away responsibly. So this is really uh, new money to the sector. And what we are trying to do is help them channel that money in the most effective way. I'm the CEO of what's called the UBS Optimus Foundation. And that's the bank's foundation that helps our clients to channel their money into some of the most effective programs. So if we look at the issue of undernutrition for girls. We've heard already uh, from Minister Bebo, also known as Amy, and from JB, that, that there are more than a billion girls suffering from undernutrition. We also know that um, investing in nutrition is probably the best investment we can make. And this is from some of the leading economists in the world who, say, who tell us that the return on investment is $16, so for every single dollar we invest in undernutrition, we yield a $16 return. Now, that is probably the best investment we could get anywhere, especially in this economy. Uh, and then if we look at the cost of undernutrition, the cost of undernutrition is about $3. trillion a year, and some countries are losing up to 11% of their GDP because of undernutrition. So from a pure economic and financial perspective, this is a critical issue. And this is an issue that needs to be scaled. This is an issue that requires private sector support. We also know that the real way, the, really the only way to scale initiatives, like making sure that these one billion girls have access to nutrition, is through the government and through the private sector. This is a place that needs tremendous scale, and civil society can't do it alone. We need support from governments. We need support from the private sector. And hats off to the Canadian government uh, for showing tremendous leadership in this area. Uh, you know, I can tell you, as somebody who's, who's helping our clients channel money, to effective programs, we're always looking to the Canadian government as the leaders in this space. Uh, and you've done tremendous things with Saving Brains, with Micronutrient Initiative, uh, and other places where you've really taken a leadership role. Uh, so we want to help to bring, really, what we're trying to do is new and better money to one of the most important things uh, in the development sector, which is undernutrition. Thank you. Good. If you allow me, I stand up. If you don't allow me, we can discuss it later. <laughs> Good morning. Um, I'd like to congratulate uh, uh, MI for taking this initiative and organizing this breakfast on this uh, important topic. But I also would like to congratulate you for being here, because it's still quite early. Um, and you're all uh, very uh, awake and very listening very closely. My name is Gerda Verberg. I'm the new coordinator of the Scaling Up Nutrition movement. Let me elaborate a little bit about Scaling Up Nutrition movement. It is an initiative that started in 2010, uh, and the idea was bringing the different players together around food and nutrition, because nutrition, indeed, it's uh, on top of the list, but it should be in the center of all food-related uh, topics. So the idea was bring the different players together because they have to work together. Indeed, governments to take ownership and show responsibility, uh, private sector because they can add value, 
but it's not only it's all not only support. It's really making uh, the different stakeholders uh, uh, working together, and that's something that is not easy, because probably they all sp speak Spanish, but they do not understand each other because they still talk another language, or they have a different mindset. For instance. NGO think that private sector companies are there only to make maximum profit. So that's what, uh, wh where Sun started. Now we are in uh, 57 countries and in two states of India where the government has decided to do something about nutrition bottom up. And there we come with the, um, with the experience of uh, Sun we share lessons, we bring the players together at grassroots level in order to work bottom up. That's where Sun is uh, right now and we can do much better and much more because as the, uh, all the figures and the facts uh, show, there is a lot to be done and it's not only to have a team for one year, it's uh, to have a team for a lifetime. Um, we did uh, research in five countries um, what is necessary to improve the possibilities and the opportunities for girls and women. And we have a slogan, we bet on girls, because it's starting with girls indeed at the, in, at the uh, inception and the first thousand days of little children is of immense importance. But let me add two uh, figures to what you have heard already. Um, every year um, uh, 10 million um, young girls under 18 are married, are getting married. And 16 million uh, adolescent girls or women are uh, giving birth. <coughs> and if their nutrition is not well, we know what will happen to the baby. We know that uh, anemia is uh, one third, but in a lot of countries it's even more. It's even more, so we can do a lot about it. What did we learn from these five countries? Just five countries. Senegal, Sierra Leone, Tajikistan, uh, Malawi and Zimbabwe. We learned five lessons. First is women have to be on the table, around the table at all levels. Starting at household level, community level, but also in parliament, in uh, the region, in the county, wherever. Women at the table, at the same time, women need access. Access to land, uh, financial services, education. It's not as easy as that to do, send your, your daughters to school. Access. So decision making and access. That's the first lesson. The second lesson is indeed that girls have to be, to be sent at school and to be kept in school because First level of education is important, but if girls are able to reach the second level and to make the best out of it, um, facts and figures prove that they are much better prepared for the workforce, so uh, indeed for economic uh, contributions, but also to bring up or give birth to their children. Um, the third is that women need to be educated or uh, need to have information about good nutrition. What is good nutrition and how do you prepare it? What do you buy? What do you, what do you add? Where do you find access? The fourth is that if women are able to work together through, as we call it, sisterhood within the community, they can make much more power and they can make it rooted so that the next generation next generations uh, get it much uh, easier. And the fifth, and let's not forget, we have to make sure that women, that men are becoming champions. It's not about how they are brought up. It's not about what they are used to do already for generations. It is about what they can do to provide their children, not only their sons, but also their girls and their grandchildren, grand, grand, uh, to provide them with a better life and at the same time improve their own uh, quality of life and to open up and make this world or their community a better place. That's the lessons we learn as, um, as uh, some.
uh, scaling up diffusion movement. Um, we do something about it. We can do much more, but only if we are ready to work together or the people who are organized within Sun are uh, open, uh, opening up to work together and to ask themselves not what, um, what is in it for me, but what can we bring to the table because that's the huge change that was brought by the Sustainable Development Goals. It's not what is my part, what, but what can we bring to the table to make it holistic and to find solutions that are there not only for this year, but during a lifetime. And we can make this, our generation, the first generation that meets the target of zero hunger, but also zero malnutrition. Thank you. What did you write down? <laughs> Here. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was taking notes, but uh, what I what I what I wrote here is um, what is it that governments must do? What areas? But I was looking at an example of what we did in Mateno Health. That when I realized that 675 women were dying giving birth, I realized that the best way forward in order for us to accelerate the fight against maternal mortality was to engage the local leadership, the chiefs. <coughs> when that worked, because what a chief says, where I come from in Africa, everybody in the village will listen. So the chief said, nobody shall deliver in the village with a birth attendant, a traditional birth attendant. Everybody rushed to the, to the clinic. The clinics became congested, and the private sector stepped in to build holding shelters for women to wait there three weeks before birth. Then I learned that the same can apply to nutrition. You can have a very strong rural committee, and that's what we did. We have a grassroots committee made by, chaired by chiefs, and therefore, whatever chief says, the men and women shall eat equally and begin to change the systems that take place at household level. The situation improves for women. How do you get that to happen practically though? You can't go into people's houses and say, okay, here's the dad's plate, here's the mom's plate, we have to make sure you eat equally. How do you get that message out? It is, um, it is sensitization starting from the household level. It's for mothers to be sensitized, to be told, that they have a responsibility to change our mindset, to change how we think. So mothers will begin to tell their boy child that the boy child is equal to the girl child, that they can eat equally, that they both can eat at the table or they can eat on the mat or they can eat in the kitchen, that the boy child can be allowed to sit in the kitchen and eat what the girl child eats. When we begin to change the thinking of the people, you find that boys and girls shall be equal because I have always said, that mothers need to take responsibility of what is going on, the negative things that are happening at grassroots in Africa. I, because I, agree, I agree with you, but it's not only mothers, it's also fathers. And yes. um, to give you an example, in the, within uh, one of the five, five, five countries, we found a chief at community level who saw very young uh, girls and boys coming uh, before him because they had to get married. And he said, what? What is your age? 16? 15? 14? You don't need to be here. You need to be at school. So please go home. I will talk to your parents um, because you shouldn't get married that young. First go to school, finish uh, primary school, secondary school, learn something for life and then later on, etc. So, um, and that chief can be very proud and, and we should talk, we should uh, tell these narratives because there is the start of new thinking, a new way out. Because only women, strong women like you, probably me and we and we, all, all of us, we cannot do it uh, on our own. No. Yeah. So let's discuss, um, let's push female, a little bit female power. But let's yeah. encourage uh, and let us try to uh, convince or to just show men that there's also something in it for them. <clears throat> because it's making life also for them 
much nicer. I'm quite sure. Yes, I know, but I'm talking about a, 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 an African village where the man is not, uh, yeah. this is the other side of the house. Yeah. And the boy child is the other side of the house, and they're on the other side of the house. Yeah. So you can't meet. But you need to start by changing the mindset. And, and, I, and I believe that the father and the mother, yes, have a role to play. But in that kitchen, the father is not allowed to go in the first place. So that is what we are, we are, we are doing. That's what I had scribbled here. Mm. The role of the chiefs. Good to down there. <laughs> I like it. Um, so where does money come into this, Phyllis? Well, you gave us some very, very impressive figures. How do we factor that in? Does, does what JB is saying, does that cost money? Does it cost money to say boys and girls need to eat equally? Why do you need 75 billion <coughs> All of this will cost money because we know that children need micronutrients and we have to pay for that. So the question is, how are we going to get the money? And Gerda said something important, which is we all, the private sector cannot look at this opportunity and say, oh, what can I extract from this? The private sector has to come to this by saying, what can I bring to the table? Okay, so and that was key, and that's what I wrote down. Mm -hmm. And so what can the private sector be bring? You know, I can tell you what a large bank can bring to this table uh, in, in a lot of the, the private sector. First of all, we can bring money, which as we said, we know that it costs money to uh, fortify foods and to make sure that women and girls get essential micronutrients. We can also bring, the kind of money we can bring is risk capital, meaning that we're going to take risks that governments won't take. And this is important because unless somebody is taking these risks, we won't be able to find out what is the cheapest way to fortify foods, what's the most effective way, what's the most effective way to change behaviors in villages that have a very traditional, um, Gen, have very traditional gender roles. Um, I mean, Phyllis, can you unpack that for us a little bit? And Verda's doing this, so I know yes, she's well, like itching to get in there. Yeah, yeah, I, don't, I don't know what that means, yeah, but I know I, it means she's no, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I, yeah. no, but I think there is more that private sector, that, and especially a private sector. I'm not done with my list yet. Ah, yeah. I know, this is a conversation. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Just just take, let me, let me give us one more thing. <laughs> so so the, and, and there's, this isn't exhaustive. I'm okay. giving you a list only from the banking sector, okay. which is a small part of the okay. private sector. All right, tell us when you're finished so, on this, and then Gerda was going to have to have to the way. Okay, so the last thing is innovative financing. And this is something uh, that we can do in the nutrition sector. So we have funded the first development impact bond in India, where we are rewarding outcomes. So our clients are putting up what we're calling the risk capital to get 18,000 girls into school. And then another outcome payoff will repay our clients with interest based on those outcomes. Why would they do that? You say, why don't they just invest it directly? The reason they'll do that is because we're taking the risk. It may or may not work. And there are many people out there who only want to pay, for instance, governments, if it's successful. And this is guaranteed that a government only has to pay if the initiative is successful. So that's another thing yeah. uh, that let we me can try, bring to private Let me try to unleash um, uh, two other opportunities. First is your network, um, because fortification yeah. is of crucial importance. Absolutely. But in the end, it is as important for people to grow their own nutrition-sensitive or nutrition driven uh, food. So it's all also about agriculture, uh, horticulture and producing food. And we know um, that women, um, especially in the rural area, are, 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 are often uh, the farmer, etc. So uh, it's, it's producing food, it's storage of food, it's creating jobs uh, by processing food, etc. That is something you could use your network for because you are there already. Why not try to, um, to encourage companies to jump in and to uh, start uh, uh, producing uh, food and, and, and uh, nutritious food? Secondly, um, I think uh, we need also a culture change because um, private sector companies are looked at as making maximum profit. 
And I think the sustainable development uh, goals have made to, to have to make crystal clear that private sector, private sector companies have to do have to do more. They have their uh, objective or their obligation to make this world a better place by what they are doing and how they are doing. I learned from a CEO that he said, well, I'm not, I, well, my shareholders are my bosses to a certain level, but also my employees are my bosses because they would like to make their job and to have a good living, to send their children to school. At the same time, our consumers are my boss because they, and finally he said, but he may be a, a very special guy, also Mother Earth. Is, um, is my boss, because I have to serve this planet also. Yes, well, is he special? I think he's special. But I think there is an opportunity for private sector companies yeah. to rethink, are we doing the right things and are we doing the things right? Yeah, absolutely, I agree with you 100%. And, and we know, you know, there's been so much research done on millennials. So we know that the next generation cares about all this. We're not gonna be able to keep employees unless we are a company that is doing exactly what Gerda says. See, Pamela, I want you to have a think about a, a thought, a rallying line. But I'm just going to give you a little bit of time to do that. Because you all know what the challenge is, uh, and there's funding available. And then it's a question of what are we going to do with it? How do we take this position that we're in, which is actually a pretty positive position, and then go forward? So I want you to leave us with a rallying cry. It's sort of um, the thing that's going to carry us through for the rest of the day. I got up this morning and I heard Gerda, Phyllis, and Jaylene say this, and it's resonating in my ears. You have notepads, but you have a very good memory. Be thinking about that while Joel comes to the stage. Joel, I know you've got some important things to do. Joel Spicer. So this one is actually working now, I think. <clears throat> Can people hear me? Yep. Um, Thank you, Femi, and thank you for allowing the panel to tune out entirely while I talk, while they think about your assignment. Um, <laughs> we can multitask, we're women. Oh, right, sorry, I'm projecting men here. We, we can. Um, look, I want to thank you, Femi, and, and thank you, Amy, uh, and thank our, our, our excellent panelists for raising their voices for women's nutrition now. now. This is a really rich collection of voices, from the Director General of a leading uh, nutrition donor to the CEO of a foundation, to the global coordinator of the Scaling Up uh, Nutrition Movement, and to the former president of an entire country. I mean, this is an amazing and diverse A-team of leaders here, and I think we need to recognize that. They're true champions. So that's what it looks like. Um, so thank you. Folks, I need to say a few words that we're all on the same page. Uh, I often make the assumption people know what the Micronutrient Initiative is, but I, I realize that outside of our world, not everyone does. So I'll say a few words about it. We are a global nutrition organization that are headquartered in Canada. We're 400 people strong, and we work primarily in Africa and Asia uh, with country offices in many of the high burden countries around the world. Now, we do not have an office in Denmark at this time, but having learned that it's the happiest country in the world, my team has been lobbying me to open one. <laughs> we are considering it. But Denmark, be careful, because Canada is catching up to you. That's all I'll say. Um, as was mentioned, we reach about 500 million people every year. Uh, we are committed to saving lives, unlocking human potential, and to ending malnutrition working with our partners. Um, and we do that by focusing on packages of low-cost, high-impact nutrition interventions and we try to make sure that they get to the most vulnerable people that need them, particularly women and girls. We stand shoulder to shoulder with governments uh, because it's ultimately on them to scale it up. But we want to reinforce their efforts to figure out the how of scale up. You know, we've heard a lot about women and girls eating last and least. And I want to say that it's clear often women and girls are last in line, not only for nutrition. And sometimes they're not even in line at all. So if we want to end malnutrition, it's pretty clear we have to move women and girls to the front of the line. So that means we've, we're also going to try and close the gap between nutrition evidence, policy, and action uh, so that they don't have to wait so long to get access to the knowledge and the services they need. And we do this again, working in partnership with others. There's so many reflections I have on what the panel has said. Um, I'm not going to go into all of them right now in the interest of time because I want to hear your, your one-liners too. Um, but it's very clear to me that the panelists have made that case that women and girls' nutrition needs to be much more of a global priority than it is right now. But what I wonder is, 
If the benefits are so obvious and the cost of inaction is so great, why haven't we sorted this problem out already? You know, the financing gap to reach the global nutrition targets for the next 10 years is going to be about $7 billion per year. And just to put that in context, I want to say that around the world, we spend every year $485 billion on fossil fuel subsidies. So let's do the math. This is not a question of money. This is a question of will and a question of leadership. That's what we're talking about here. And that brings us back to Canada's anchor funding for the Right Start Initiative and why that's so significant in terms of the growing reasons we feel that we are at a critical tipping point where we're really just about to talk about the beginning of the end of malnutrition. It's just around the corner. Now, Canada has been making strong statements at home and abroad, about uh, certainly from the level of the Prime Minister, about the importance of women and girls, about inclusive growth, about equity, about youth. It is very clear that the issue of nutrition for women and girls is right at the heart of that. Because as long as one billion women and girls are malnourished, it's going to be, frankly, impossible to reach many of the SDG goals, as has been said, let alone our ambition for a more inclusive and a better world. Very briefly, I'm going to unpack the Right Start initiative so we know what we, what we mean when we say that, and what are we going to do. So we have the stretch target of reaching 100 million women and adolescent girls, as well as newborns and children, by 2020. And Canada's anchor funding of $75 million gets us halfway there. So it has several main features. You know, first, it's high impact programs. That means when we target adolescents and women of reproductive age, pregnant women and newborns, infants and young children, the types of interventions that we're gonna support are fortified foods, counseling for girls at key contacts, weekly micronutrient supplements, uh, packages of care at birth. It's moving, trying to move beyond the siloed approach and try to look at what women and girls need when you look at their, put their needs at the center. Uh, micronutrient powders, screening for malnutrition and referral, promotion of exclusive and continued breastfeeding, uh, packages of cord care, kangaroo care, things that make sense. Um, other key components, resource mobilization and strategic partnerships. Right? Canada's leadership is also uh, helping us drive forward conversations with other donors about how to practically engage on the issue of women and girls' nutrition much more. And that's shining a light for that. Uh, new strategic partners that are focused on expanding the reach, because we can't do it all by ourselves. We've been having some fascinating conversations even here at Women Deliver. So as I mentioned, we're going to help shrink that gap between evidence and action, generating evidence of what works, because a lot of countries are given lists of what they're supposed to do, but the how to scale it up is not always clear. And so uh, part of this initiative will also be sitting with countries to work on the how and providing a lot of technical assistance where it's needed, working with partners in coordination like with the Sun Network in order to support country efforts. And finally, advocacy, and welcome, we're here, this is one of those things. We want to use Right Start as a platform to raise the importance of this issue, not only at international level, but at country level too. Because we know that fundamentally, um, it's going to be about high burden countries increasing their own budgets for this. But that can't happen until we show them the evidence of what works and they see it for themselves and until their institutions and their capacity is strengthened enough to be able to take it forward and that's our ultimate goal. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end it here but before I do I just want to highlight that the Right Start initiative does not view women and girls as passive recipients of nutrition interventions but at full power we see women and girls as the driving force within a global movement that is going to bring about the end of malnutrition. It can't happen without them. Ending malnutrition starts with women and girls. So what, is, what can all of you do in this advocacy movement? Well, I mentioned this a little bit before yesterday, but for those that miss it, if you're a journalist, a campaigner, or an advocate, we need your help to raise your voice and shine a light on this issue, uh, to demand greater investment for women and girls' nutrition. And if you are an organization uh, that is providing services to people, think about whether we're missing opportunities to really empower women and girls. Because there are a lot of people that do a great job reaching the most vulnerable people, but we're all kind of doing our own things. And we need to put people at the center and look at what they need. Uh, if you're a government, how can you put nutrition at the center of policy, planning, and budgeting? And if you're a donor, 
We say thank you for focusing on women and girls, but now's an opportunity to take it up a notch. You know, and with intention and deliberation, let's do whatever we can to remove the breaks of malnutrition from women and girls that are keeping them back. So I'm gonna stop there. I'm gonna hand over to Femi and just say thanks to all of you very much for coming at this early hour. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Giles Spicer, President and CEO of Micronutrient Initiative. So, uh, Phyllis, your final... My final thought, I'm gonna leave you with some M's. So you said make it memorable. So, I'm gonna say, do the math. Put your money, mouth, and motivation behind malnutrition for girls. You wouldn't even like that. <laughs> so far. Sure. Um, my thoughts for today is, for the day and for the rest of the year, I would say, um, we can be the generation that ends hunger and malnutrition. And how do we do this? I would say bet on girls and invest in them. Um, I would like to say that, uh, as John said, we are launching the Right Start Initiative. And the uh, macronutrients where I serve on the board have decided to reach 100 million women and girls in five years. And I want to say that I'm joining that campaign today. And I'm a champion. What about you? Yeah. What about you? <laughs> but I've spent the last 10 years feeding 15,000 children every single day with the help of No Skin of the US that gave me uh, the feed that I need. Now, I am proud here that Canada has taken the lead. And I want to congratulate the government of Canada. And I want you to know that in Africa, where I come from, we are not just sitting there waiting for handouts. We want to join the fight. And we want you to know that you have partners. That's why there's a big group from Malawi here. Because we realize how important it is. And we want you to know that we don't take your commitment for granted. JB says, what about you? I have an idea. Uh, we need to do a selfie with this, all of us. So everybody come up here, all stand here, and then JB and Gerda and Phyllis. Stand up, everybody. Walk forwards. This is why I became a journalist. Closer, 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 closer. Very good. Who wants to hold this up? Come closer. I did shower this morning. I got up early, but I did shower. Okay, <laughs> who's holding this? All right, I'm doing it this way. Okay, hold that up. All right, very good. All right, turn around. All right.